Hi everyone and welcome to this year's virtual Princeton Environmental Film Festival. We're very pleased tonight to be able to uh, share a presentation and a Q&A with filmmaker and author William McKeever. He'll be out in a minute and we'll just tell you a little bit about him. He is actually on a mission to raise awareness for sharks and protect our oceans. His two-year journey around the world resulted in his book and this documentary film, which I hope you've seen. And if not, you still have a few more days to watch it through our platform. William is a former financial analyst, and he is the founder of the NGO uh, Safeguard the Seas, which is um, and is devoted to ocean conservancy. So um, I just want to point out a couple of housekeeping notes for this evening. As you can see, there's a chat and feel free to say hello or mention some of the films that you've been watching this week. And you can also, um, you can see that right underneath me, there's a green bar and that will enable you if you'd like to purchase William's book, Emperors of the Sea. And um, also at some point, um, so he'll be out in a second. He's going to do a presentation first and then uh, we'll, we'll go into a Q&A uh, session. So the chats will shut down during the presentation, but you see there's a feature on the bottom of your screen. It's called Ask a Question. So at any point you can um, click that open and type in a question that you'd like to ask William. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming William McKeever. Ah, there he is. <laughs> Like that. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction, and, and thanks to the uh, Princeton Environmental Film Festival for having me on. It's always a great pleasure, and I always, any chance I get to talk about sharks is, is great, uh, my favorite. And sharks seemingly are always in the news, and recently they've been on headlines. Some of you may have seen this because of COVID. And uh, whenever you have a vaccine, uh, typically you'll have an adjuvant. What that just simply means, it's something that boosts the vaccine. And that's made out of a material called a squalene. Now, sharks uh, produce massive amounts of squalene in their liver. So if we're going to have uh, millions of vaccines, uh, as one of my colleagues, so I'll uh, put a shout out to Shark Allies they pointed out that we will need 500 million sharks to provide enough squalene for the vaccines for COVID. Now, I'm here to, to tell you that we can't afford, to, as much as important as it is to have vaccines, to wipe out the shark population from the planet. First of all, I think it would be virtually impossible, but more importantly, there are substitutes for the squalene that go into the vaccines. And I think people need to be aware of the, this issue and also about sharks and what's happening to sharks. You know, if this is a, was a species that was doing well, that was plentiful, uh, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But the reality is exactly the opposite. Sharks are in the, facing the greatest threat they've ever faced in their 450 million year history on the planet and they are dying by a great number. And I don't want to get that number yet because I'm going to launch into a PowerPoint presentation about sharks and discuss uh, this issue. So with that, let me get into the, uh, into the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, this is the title of the book, Emperors of the Deep, the Shark, the Ocean's Most Mysterious, Most Misunderstood, and Most Important uh, Guardians. And uh, that's me uh, diving with sharks. And uh, what I'm gonna do in this presentation is tell you my story, the latest discoveries on sharks, and the last few years, have, it's been a remarkable period Scientists have uncovered a great deal of information, which I'm going to share with you. And then we're going to talk about shark attacks and separate fiction from reality. Of course, the media loves to build up shark attacks, but the reality is very different from what the media uh, portrays. 
And then something that I think is very important to talk about is that sharks are very important to the marine ecosystem. So this is uh, a, a clip um, on a shark and this was where it all got started. Eco shark only tournament. This apex predator can grow up to over a thousand pounds and yet it can sprint 45 miles an hour. Anglers like to catch makos, which fight hard and they can leap 20 to 30 feet in the air. This is no sporting game for the shark. He is in a desperate fight for his life. Right down there. The shark is hooked, and now the life and death struggle begins. Powerful engines with thousands of horsepower take on sharks weighing as little as 125 pounds. The battles can last one to two hours. Uh, I'm going to stop that because at that point, that's where we uh, unfortunately see the uh, the shark killed, and I have a difficult time watching this. Um, you know, this this was uh, when I went undercover for a shark tournament, and shark tournaments are where fishermen go out uh, trophy hunting. Goal is to catch the biggest shark, and they gamble. Uh, they'll they'll wager on the boats, and some fishermen will make as much as a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars even uh, if they catch the biggest shark. And what happens at the end of the tournament is that the shark is thrown literally into landfills throughout uh, Long Island. And um, in the in the film, you you can see some of the uh, the big trailers that they have to bring in, stuff the sharks in that, and they're carted off uh, to those landfills. Now, I, I found this uh, terribly upsetting. Uh, this is a apex predator, and it's being killed for sport. So I am working uh, very hard to put an end to these uh, shark tournaments. And when I went undercover and filmed that, it started a process of where I wanted to understand what was happening to sharks. And so I just kept on going. And at the end of uh, a couple of years, I had this film and I had this book and I had a new mission in my life, which was to help save sharks as well as the ocean. So my story began with that shark tournament and with what happened to that Mako shark that you saw there. Now, uh, the upside is that I learned a great deal about sharks. Uh, as I mentioned, we've gotten some new insights. We've got tagging studies that show where they go. Uh, we uh, learn about new species all the time. So let me just give you one example of what we've learned. Now, the thresher shark is one that has a very long tail. In fact, it's equal to the length of its body. So a 20-foot thresher shark, 10 feet of that will be its tail. And scientists didn't know why they had this long tail until someone filmed a thresher shark doing something that thresher sharks do every day. And you're about to see it. There you can see the uh, the long tail. And this is their weapon. They hurl themselves in a bait ball and throw the tail over their head into the fish, kill the fish, and then come back 
and and eat the fish. This is the only animal in the entire animal kingdom that hunts with its tail. And for that reason, uh, these sharks are valued uh, in shark tournaments. People want to put that tail up on uh, on a trophy. So let me, you can just see that tail whip um, again into that bait ball and, uh, and yet again. Now, um, that's the thresher shark. We finally learned why they have those long tails. This is, of course, a hammerhead shark. And uh, we've learned a great deal about hammerheads. Let me start, uh, first of all, with the eye. And the scientists were able to determine that the sharks have eyes perched on their heads that give them a 360 degree view around their environment. And that head is loaded with all kinds of high tech gear, if you will. They're sensors so that it can tell if there are live animals buried in the sand that are hiding from them. So I'm gonna play the clip and you can see just how graceful and uh, magnificent this animal is. Note the high dorsal fin. Um, that fin can sometimes be as long as two or three feet, which gets him in trouble because a lot of people want those fins. And in fact, the fin is so high that the shark will swim sideways and use its dorsal fin as kind of a sail to give it more efficiency. Uh, scientists have determined that they get as much as 10% greater swimming efficiency when they swim on their side using that fin to create extra lift. Uh, this is a female that got raped in a mating uh, event. This is typical. They all Females all get raked like this, but their skin is three times thicker than a male, so they're ready to, uh, to take it. See the small mouth on the hammerhead? Uh, very rare for any serious injuries from a hammerhead shark. Uh, we're also learning about uh, new species of sharks. Uh, we're now over 500. I can remember, wasn't too long ago, reading a book and finding that uh, they thought at the time there was 250 species of sharks. Well, that's now doubled over the last uh, a couple of decades. Uh, this is a sawtooth shark, which is found in Asia. It looks like a, uh, a bad uh, Halloween costume uh, with a couple of eyes staring at you, but this is a bottom-up view of, of these sharks. Again, no one knew that these even existed. And I suspect the scientists are gonna keep on discovering new sharks. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a, a shark, it's a cat shark that actually, you're right, it's out of water. It walks on top of the reef. It uses its pectoral fins as feet and it manages to get enough oxygen from the air to stay outside and hunt for small crustaceans, uh, small fish in these little reef uh, pieces. And they do extremely well. They're small sharks, they're only about a couple of feet long. Uh, but we had no idea that sharks walk, so hence the name uh, the walking shark. Um, now, the another thing that uh, scientists have uncovered is that sharks are a lot like people. So I'm going to start off and talk about the great white. Uh, just a couple of things to consider. Their uh, gestation period is like us, 11 months. Uh, they don't give birth to many pups, by the way. All the births are live. They can have as few as two, but maybe four. And when that baby white shark is born, it's rare to go. The mother does not stick around to provide any milk or to provide any education. They have to fend for themselves. So those juvenile white sharks end up eating uh, small fish for the first seven years of their life. Now, obviously we know humans are long-lived like the great white, they are, we are also a species that takes a long time 
for development. It takes 20 years or so for a human to mature. And the same is true for a great white. They will not, the female will not be able to breed until they're at least 20. And some scientists believe that it's not until uh, 25 or 30 when they're having their first uh, pups. And then of course they can continue to breed and live to be as old as 75 years of age. Now they eat seals, uh, that's their main uh, prey item. Now the question is, why is that? And uh, sharks are big, robust animals. Uh, they can, great whites can grow to uh, 20 feet, uh, weigh 3,000 pounds, and uh, they travel great distances. So they need energy. So they get that from seals because seals have blubber, which is fat, energy rich, helps to recharge that shark's uh, liver so that they can continue to do all the things that they, they need to do. So what happens is that uh, seals are their number one prey item and humans, when they're on surfboards and wearing uh, wetsuits, we look like uh, those seals. But the important point here is that we're looking at, at uh, a species that is very delicate from a reproduction standpoint. When you hurt this species, their population, they don't come back. Cod, as an example, one female will lay millions of eggs. So they can come back, maybe. Some places in the world, they were overfished, they still haven't come back. But for the great white, it's a death signal when, when they, their populations are hit. Now, right now, scientists do not know how many great whites are left in the wild. I had one estimate, maybe there were 5,000. South Africa did a study, they thought they had 2,000 great whites. Uh, turned out they only had 500. And we don't have any idea how many great whites are off of our coast. So we should be protective of uh, particularly these large sharks like the great white. Uh, this is uh, this gives you a little feel for uh, their prey items, the seal. The seal, the great white shark's favorite meat. Now you can see in, in that in that film, um, the shark at the end got the seal. Many of these uh, seal attacks don't work, uh, but uh, sharks have honed their skills over the few decades that it took for them to grow, where they can catch these sharks by swimming along the bottom, looking up, and then launching themselves in a vertical position uh, to the seal. And it, the timing has to be exquisite. Uh, everything has to come together and they are truly uh, remarkable predators. Uh, another thing about sharks is that uh, they are not these uh, solitary animals that people used to think. Uh, here are a couple of great whites off of New Zealand. You can see the one on top is, is extremely exposed to the one on the bottom. Uh, these two sharks are seen together all the time. Uh, they're known as the brothers. And the photographer who took this, uh, my friend uh, Chris Fallows in South Africa, uh, has routinely seen four or five great whites uh, together. And um, another uh, friend, uh, Christine Zanotto, uh, has actually gone uh, diving with sharks and has taken out with her bare hands the hooks that are left in the shark's mouth from the shark tournaments are just hunting for sharks in, in general. And uh, she has a remarkable website where the sharks actually react to her in a very positive way. They seek her out and there's clear evidence by looking at the video 
that when she gets the hook out, the shark is relieved and comes over. So we're seeing this glimpse of a different side of sharks as social animals. And in the book, I grow into great detail about lemon sharks that live in the mangroves in the Bahamas. Uh, a scientist at the University of Miami uh, recorded these lemon sharks actually pairing up, forming friendships. Um, many of them hang out with the same uh, type uh, or same age uh, of lemon shark. So if they're juvenile, the juveniles hang out together, the same sex hangs out together. And it's really quite remarkable. And he was able to document this. So that's something else that we need to think about. They're not solitary. They're, they are looking to be very aware of their environment. And now we get to the issue of attacks. And I think this is another one of the many myths around sharks that need to be overturned. Now, this chart is uh, from the International Shark Attack file. Hopefully you can see it. It's uh, a view of the number of attacks by decade from 1900. Now, you can see that there is an increase in attacks year after year. So the media takes this as we're having more shark attacks. That means the sharks are coming in shore. They're looking for us. The reality is very different. The fact is, is that shark attacks are a function of the number of people that are in the water. And as the population has grown and more people have more affluence and they're going to the beach, that's where we're having more uh, interaction and more attacks. It's sharks are not uh, looking upon us as uh, prey items. Uh, they're doing what they are supposed to do, which as apex predators, they're looking throughout the ecosystem for weak, diseased fish, keeping the fish population healthy, doing a, a spring cleaning, uh, if you will. They're also keeping uh, population levels appropriate so you don't get any one species that's out of whack, if you will, with where it should be in the ecosystem. So they literally come right up to the beach. And this is a beautiful bull shark that's literally just two feet. They do this all the time. And um, I've had the pleasure of seeing a few sharks along the beach. Most people have no idea that they're there. And again, to my point is, when a shark comes across a human, uh, most of the time they just swim away. Now, the, um, the, the, if you look at the species of sharks, the ones that cause the most commotion are the big three, the great white, the tiger, and the bull. These are the ones that are responsible for uh, the great bulk of the attacks. Now, obviously, they're bigger sharks. They're looking for bigger prey. We're the right size. But again, they're looking really for the seals, the dolphins, those big marine mammals, um, the uh, sea leopards. That's what they're really after to get that uh, blubber. Uh, smaller sharks, uh, very rare to have a, a, a death due to an attack. Um, this is something that um, I think is important to, to know. Mako sharks, uh, there has never been a recorded death from a Mako shark. Um, so here I am uh, again, just showing a, a clip here with a with a great white shark, and uh, and this is off of South Africa. The country of South Africa has the third highest number of shark attacks in the world. Many of them by great whites. My name's Joseph Kroner. I'm from Mossel Bay, South Africa. I've served most of my life since I was five years old. Um, and I was attacked by a shark, great white. I had been surfing for a while, had a few waves, and I was busy paddling. And I was halfway up and just decided to have a rest. So I, I put both my arms up on the board and I was just sort of lying, lying flat on the board. But that's when it happened. When I came 
from behind. So I just slowly felt myself lifting up. Um, and then my mind sort of blanks out. I remember when I came up out the water, I looked straight at it swimming away from me. And that was probably the most hectic part, just to see the intensity of the animal. I just saw of white water and the board. I could see the board sticking out on either side. So at that stage, it was probably broken because it was sticking out at an angle. Out of the shark's mouth? Out of its mouth, yeah. So this is the piece that the great white bit out of my surfboard. Um, you can obviously see the shape of its mouth and you can get an indication of the size. I think they would have worked out the size at three and a half meters just from the sort of the size of the bite. Yeah, you can have a look. So the, the teeth are here. here. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty sure. I uh, see sharks as sort of beautiful animals. I've only got more respect for them because of the attack. They're very graceful and mostly peaceful. So I see them with a lot of respect and and all. So I, I think uh, this this surfer um, obviously was unharmed. Um, I think says it all. Now I don't want I don't mean to minimize that there are accidents. There are sometimes uh, when there are mistakes. Um, so let's actually let's look at those numbers and. Uh, and uh, where are the world, well, if you look around the world, where are the attacks? And uh, the United States has more shark attacks than any other country on the planet. Uh, second is Australia, and uh, they're not even close. And the reason is, is that we have uh, two very long coastlines, and we've got lots of people that like going to the beach. And so, again, you have the number one ingredient, which is lots of people in the water. And that happens and to a great extent in Florida. So over half of the attacks in the United States are in Florida, uh, followed by Hawaii, and then a small sliver in uh, California and other states. And uh, Florida is uh, the surfing capital of the world, uh, or rather of the United States. Uh, so that's why they have the most number of attacks. Uh, if you look at the activity that's involved, number one is surfing. More than half the attacks are surfers. Why? Because they look like prey items. Uh, swimming, uh, that sometimes people, they're out there from shore, they're kicking, uh, they're behaving like making a lot of noise. Uh, so that puts them at risk. But once a shark can see a, uh, a human, whether they're snorkeling or particularly scuba diving, no, they're not on the on, on the menu. They will move on. Um, now, specifically, the there's been a decline in the number of attacks. The five-year average is 55. Uh, last year, we were 41. 2020 will be less than that. And so, again, the media would not want to build this up, but the reality is, Shark, if 2020 holds, this will be the third year that shark attacks are down. Now, why is that? Well, uh, number one reason is global change. The black tip shark. Uh, this is kind of a middle level predator. They're not an apex predator like a great white, uh, but they're, they're a shark that not to be uh, fiddled with. They can grow seven, eight feet, uh, get to be about 150, 200 pounds. Uh, now, historically, their range has been from uh, North Carolina in the summer down to Miami in the winter months. Uh, sharks are like people. They want to be in a water temperature that's suitable to their species. Um, I like the black tip because they like water temperature around 72, which is what I like. And uh, they move down uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the winter months right when humans are out there. So what happens is that in the surfing areas, you get the shark attacks. Uh, the surfing capital of the world uh, in Florida is Smyrna Beach, and that's where the most attacks uh, take place. Now, what's happened with global warming is that the black tip sharks no longer have to go to Miami 
to get their preferred range of temperature. So they'll stop around Georgia. And so there are fewer black tip sharks swimming down the coast in Florida. So without the sharks being there, the number of attacks are down. Uh, conversely, in the summertime, the sharks have to move farther north because they want, again, that band, the right temperature. So they're coming up to our neck of the woods, to uh, Long Island. And uh, it just now a, a case where these black tips have to travel another thousand miles. So it's a stressor for sharks with what's going on with, uh, with global change. And I go into this in more detail in my book about global climate change and what it means to sharks. It's definitely a negative for sharks. Um, now, in terms of dealing with shark attacks, I think we just have to get uh, smarter as a species. I think, first of all, from a big picture, uh, we're going in, into their world. This is a wilderness, and we have to respect that. And, uh, and I think with the right kind of equipment, uh, right kind of uh, philosophy, that if we let the sharks have their space and we have ours, that we can coexist. And that's a good thing. When you see sharks, that means the ocean is healthy. They're doing their job. When you don't see sharks, that's a bad sign. So on the far right side, uh, we're using drones in places around the world. Australia is using them, having great success. In South Africa, they use uh, shark spotters. These are people literally hanging out on hills with binoculars. They see the shark, a uh, horn goes off, people get out of the water, the shark swims by, people get back in the water and enjoy surfing again. So those are ways that we can uh, minimize our interaction. I think we need to do things like that around the Cape. Uh, and finally, I just want to say the drum lines, which are big hooks that catch and kill sharks, culling sharks, nets to protect people, they don't work. Because what ends up happening is if there was an attack, that shark is long gone in the next 24 hours. So these lines end up catching another shark and killing it. And that's just something, again, we don't want. Um, the sharks, uh, and this is one of the one of the takeaways that I want you uh, to leave with uh, tonight. Sharks are crucial uh, to the marine ecosystem, and in my journey, um, I was uh, I learned a great deal from scientists and how important. Now, unfortunately, tonight we don't have time to go through these three main uh, areas, so I'm just going to deal with seagrass. But this was an interview I did with Mike Heidhouse, who did a study. So let me uh, run that clip for you. So we've been working on tiger sharks in the seagrass ecosystem of Western Australia. It looks a lot like seagrass should have all around the world, maybe centuries ago before people started affecting these systems. And what we've been trying to figure out is what would happen if we lost tiger sharks. But why we want to know this is that seagrasses are really important for lots of reasons. First and foremost, they provide food and habitat for small fish, shrimps, crabs. They grow up to be important in food webs, but are also species that people want to catch and eat. And so we need to make sure we're protecting seagrass ecosystems for that reason. But it also turns out that they're important for climate change because they store a lot of carbon dioxide. The seagrass pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, builds up more seagrass, and then when that seagrass dies, it gets buried. So it's kind of sequestering carbon. So if we lose seagrasses, that carbon dioxide is going to end up in the atmosphere and may make things worse for climate change. Seagrass grows almost everywhere along the world's coastlines. So what we've done is study tiger sharks and a lot of their prey, like dugongs, which are sea cows, and sea turtles. And those are the big grazers on seagrass. What we found is that the tiger sharks change where these big grazers feed. And where it's really dangerous, there are lots of tiger sharks, those grazers spend almost no time there. And that kind of protects the seagrass. So we get these really big, dense forests of seagrass that provide great habitat, and also sequester lots of carbon dioxide. Now in those areas where the sharks aren't as dangerous and the big grazers spend their time, you have very little seagrass. It looks like a really 
closely cropped lawn, not a lot of carbon being buried, and also not a lot of place for the little fish to hide and grow up. And so what that showed us is that the tiger sharks really are controlling not just where the big grazers are spending their time, but actually the seagrass beds themselves. So what we're seeing in this one situation is that sharks are probably critical to maintaining the health of oceans. When it comes to big animals like tiger sharks, there is really no other animal that can fill their role. There's no other species out there that can threaten adult sea cows. There's no other species that can you know, tear through a turtle shell so effectively and control their populations. Tiger sharks also consume garbage, including tires and license plates. Well, um, as I was saying at the end there, the tiger sharks do, uh, they have found really virtually everything in, in uh, the stomach of a tiger shark from torsos, uh, license plates, um, you, you name it. It was, they're doing their job. They're cleaning the ocean. They're the great scavengers. But that, that, I love that clip because it shows you um, about the importance of, of sharks. So let me uh, turn towards uh, the, uh, the, what's happening to them today. And uh, sharks are in, are in serious trouble. Uh, the main reason is long line fishing. I'm gonna give you a very quick explanation. You can see in this diagram, see there's just one line in long line fishing and attached to it are, are hooks. And what happens is just terrible to, to sharks. Uh, of course, other animals are caught. So uh, let me show you, these are seabirds um, and uh, I'm just going to jump ahead right to this clip. This was uh, when I talked, when I went on board the Rainbow Warrior, part of Greenpeace. Uh, they're, they're doing their part to stop um, what's happening out here. So here's uh, the video. The crew of the Rainbow Warrior boards a fishing vessel to inspect their records. The log book really didn't line up for the amount of time that it had been at sea already, which was more than two months. Uh, 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 it's only supposed to be three shots in total. In the last cruise of holes we checked, we found three sets of shark fins. There's more than 600 shark fins from various different We'll be hacked apart, the fins chopped off and put in the hole, and the body of the shark will be dumped back overboard. And often that can still be alive at that point. And without its spin, it's simply going to die of painful and slow death in the ocean. Uh, that, uh, what you saw taking place on that vessel, takes place every day around the world. And scientists estimate that 100 million sharks are killed a year. And the primary use of that is for shark fin soup. Uh, that's the number one reason that sharks are in serious trouble. I mentioned shark tournaments. Uh, of course, that doesn't help either. Uh, people do eat sharks for their meat in third world countries. And uh, these other items, lipstick is actually made from the squalene of the shark. So I think when people realize how important they are to the ecosystem, uh, I think I'm, that people are going to start to turn around. And what we need are the kind of uh, protections 
in place to protect these sharks. Now, uh, we all can play a role in this. Whenever you go into the supermarket to buy seafood, you're sending a message to the marketplace. And uh, for those of you that like to eat tuna, uh, you may want to consider a different type of canned tuna, and that's pole caught tuna. That's where you have one fisherman with one line catching one fish at a time. There's no bycatch of sharks, and that fish uh, that you're eating did not result in the death of a shark. And you also may want to consider eating domestic. You know, we have very good rules in this country, better than any other country on the planet. So when you buy domestic food, I think you can be comfortable that we're doing the right thing, uh, or the, those fishermen were, were following the rules. So the important thing is when you go out uh, to a restaurant or to a supermarket, ask, ask, where did my fish come from? There actually is a program that was implemented last year called the Seafood Import Management Program so that the seafood suppliers have to say where their food comes from. And when enough consumers get up and say, I want to know where this comes from, is it caught with, with slaves? Slavery is a big issue on the Pacific Ocean. Is this fish caught with, with a shark uh, bycatch? The list goes on and on. And so I think when, you, when, when we show people, these, these suppliers that we care, then we start seeing a shift in the seafood uh, supply chain. And also, I think it's important to get involved. We have legislation pending in the Senate that would ban trading of shark fins. Remarkably, it is legal to trade shark fins in the United States. It is an abomination we allow that to happen. Canada banned trading in shark fins. If they can do it, we can do it. And get involved. There's Greenpeace, there's Oceana, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. There are all kinds of NGOs or non governmental organizations that you can join. Be involved. Your participation allows them to go to a congressman or a congresswoman and say, These are people we represent. This is what we want you to do. And, um, and I'm uh, doing my part. Um, I believe in education. I think if people can understand the myths of sharks are just plain wrong that and that we need sharks, I think that's going to play an important step. So please follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm a William McKeever official. And uh, that's my website, williammckeever.com. I also started a nonprofit called Safeguard the Seas. And the website is safeguardtheseas.org. And I have a couple of petitions there. And you can sign a petition asking uh, the Senate to pass the, the bill I mentioned. And also in New York State, they are considering a ban in trophy hunting. And uh, they should put sharks on that list. Uh, and so when they hear from people, even if it's from out of state, um, it shows that people care. So please consider that. Um, as you know, I, I have a book. Um, the hardcover came out a while ago. The paperback just came out. Had a few additions I, I made to that about global warming. So you can get that. Click on that on the uh, website uh, for the film festival or go to Labyrinth Books, and you can buy the book uh, at the store uh, online. And here's uh, the cover of the book, uh, Emperors of the Deep makes it great. Uh, still fall to, to uh, read uh, about it. And also, uh, when you're thinking about uh, Christmas, I actually saw some Christmas de decorations up, it makes the perfect Christmas present uh, especially uh, what's encouraging is that uh, young people from 18 to 30, uh, uh, girls and boys, men and women, all really are, are love sharks. And I love to see this change uh, taking place. It's a perfect gift for, for someone like that. And uh, so with that, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, turn, turn it over to uh, a Q&A. 
Thank you, William. All right. So there are, uh, we encourage people to uh, click on ask a question and you can put your question in there. I have a couple things I can get started with. And uh, first things first, um, you know, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the film. I mean, this is your first film that you ever made. Is that true? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No, no earlier basement movies or anything? Well, I, I, I did one small, one short film to kind of get my feet wet in the documentary okay. space. So I did, I did learn something, this, but this is my, my first uh, feature length film. Okay. Well, I mean, it's really wonderful. It's beautifully shot. The, um, the underwater photography is outstanding. I thought you did an excellent job with the narration. For those of you who, who saw the film and you're thinking tonight, how do I know his voice? That, that is why. Um, you, I thought your choice of music was was terrific, and it just had a really great tone and pacing. Um, and I just would like to add that that final underwater scene, the final scene in the film where there's you're, you're underwater, was really beautiful. Perfect choice of music, and it just really brought the whole film home. I thought so. I mean, really wonderful job, William. Really well, Thank you, Susan. That's nice of you to, to say that. I really appreciate it. I have to tell you a quick story. Uh, that last scene where the sharks are swimming all around me, th what we to get the sharks over to me, we had to bribe them. So there was a woman who had a skewer and fish on the end of the skewer, and she would hold it around me. And one time she put the face, the, the, <laughs> shark, uh, the shark saw that I had a, a, a fish literally right this close <laughs> to my face. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to yell to her to get back. And um, anyway, it was too late. And in the corner of my eye, I saw a bull shark uh, bearing down on me full speed. And I just thought, don't move. <laughs> and uh, the shark came and grabbed the fish. So it uh, made a good choice. But its pectoral fin hit me in the face wow. and went across. Now, as I learned, sharks. Oh, that would have really changed that scene. <laughs> uh, yeah, sharks have, uh, like a lot of fish, they have a film. It covers their skin and it protects them from viruses and bacteria. And that shark film got on my face. And uh, I thought, and not too many people in the world that can say they've got shark slime on their face. <laughs> so I, I refused to wash my face. It took about two days for it to get off. But I love that. That was that was one of my highlights. And I have to confess, due to the movie Jaws, which I think should be banned as utter garbage, uh, you know, even the people that that made the film realized that it was all made up. And um, you know, th this uh, I started out being very nervous uh, when I was around them. And by the end of the of the filming and writing the book. Um, I'm a big fan of shark ecotourism in New Jersey and New York, and I did a, uh, an open water dive in Florida, and I jumped over the side of the boat, and uh, three bull sharks were swimming around me. They knew I wasn't, I was fine, uh, and it was just a fabulous experience. So I think that's one of the best things you can do, have that adventure, do a shark dive. And they're up and down the East Coast. You can go to my website, find out where they are. Sounds great. So, uh, William, you're, how, you've, um, the film just came out last year, 2019. Is that right? Uh, it came out late uh, 2019. That's right. So, so you had some, you know, because of what's going on right now, um, it probably wasn't how you expected things to be. You probably anticipated a lot more in-person screenings. So um, with the amount of events that you have had and virtual events, what's the reaction uh, that people have to the film? What kind of experience are you having sharing it with people and the book? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, a couple of things come to mind. I think number one is that people are stunned that 100 million sharks are killed every year. I don't think people people here before did not know, know about that, the massacre. The, the destruction. I think that's number one. Number two is that they come away with a new appreciation of sharks. They don't realize uh, that sharks are really very important to the ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to give you an analogy, in Yellowstone, uh, they took the wolves out half a century ago and it was a disaster for Yellowstone Park. And they had to bring the wolves, they imported them from Canada. And the same thing happens 
uh, in, a, in a marine ecosystem, when you take the sharks out, that is the death knell to that ecosystem. Obviously, we don't have time now, but if you go look at the book, um, I talk about the importance of sharks in coral reef systems mm -hmm. and what happened in Australia when sharks were removed. Those coral reefs literally crumbled. So uh, I wish I had more time, but um, that's those are the two big takeaways. The massacre uh, just a couple of months ago, 26 tons of shark fins were confiscated from a smuggler in Hong Kong. Now that's 26 tons of fins, that's not the body. So that represents about 38,000 sharks in one shipment going to China. This stuff is going on every day. And, and I think the more we know about this, uh, we can again uh, think about the seafood we buy, uh, if it comes from China, uh, if it comes from the United States, you know, maybe think twice, maybe make sure you buy only American. Right. And and the thing about the, the shark fins, one of the, the driving forces to, to get the fins is to have uh, extract the gelatinous material that's in the fin to to put into soup. And it's really sad because that kind of gelatinous material be, could be found in, in some other way. With, without you know a shark having to lose its fins and its life, um, but yeah. it's a cultural thing, and and that'll take time. And I think, you know, with with education, with films like yours, with people becoming more aware, with children embracing these ideas and and growing up with a different sensibility, I think that helps. And um, just the other thing I want to point out, and then let's take some questions. But I thought you really made um, you built a really good bridge to the uh, environmental justice issues and. Some of the some of the fisher uh, some of the people fishing, especially in Southeast Asia, they're they don't make a living wage. So for them to be able to make some money on the side, you know, harvesting the fins, um, you know, so it's just it, it's a corruption breeds corruption. But the other part of that is is some of the some of these people are actually enslaved and they're out at sea, you know, um, and you know, having just living in horrendous conditions and separated from their families. And they're um, part, part of the reason they're doing that is again, the whole balance of things and the whole ecosystem of, of people um, overfishing that has driven people further and further out to sea. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of, there's a whole chain of things. It's, it's like, it's like the line fishing with all the hooks. There's a lot of bad hooks all, all along the way. So, yeah. But you're shining a light on that, which is just fantastic. And and I think in the way that um, your film presents everything so clearly, and I think it's, it's accessible and it's, um, you know, just, it's very rich. Um, so let, let's jump over to some questions. I see, what do we have here? Let's see. Um, let's see. Oh, here's one. Do you have a favorite personal interaction with a shark? Yeah, that's a that's a good that's a good question. Well, of course, uh, having the slime on my face was uh, uh, that 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 was number one. Um, this uh, let's see a personal one. Um, uh, you know, the the one that that really it gets me and and. Uh, I didn't have this happen, but um, this I get to get back to uh, Christine Zanato, who, who does removes the hooks, and um, she said that when she removed the hook from that shark, the shark came around and the shark put its head in her lap, and she was petting it and stroking it, and the shark didn't move; it just stayed there. And then she had to leave, and then she came back the next day. That same shark came back, and she had this the same experience. Um, uh, some, <laughs> some, some, some. Hold one second, please. There's some, I may have an emergency. Yes. I have to apologize. <laughs> this is one of the problems of 
living in a in a uh, co-op in New York City. Um, anyway, uh, I won't go into the details, but but everything is fine. So so the so, so what happened was that um, again she showed to me that uh, sharks feel great pain with these hooks. Um, they're uncomfortable. Even the tagging of sharks, uh, those tags weigh them down. They get sick from having to lug those things around. So the best thing we can do is just let those sharks alone and uh, they'll be just fine. And, um, and when they're fine, we're fine. And I think that uh, you really make an excellent point in one of the, like, the advocacy points of, of your work in this film is you know the statistics the statistic that for every 10 tuna that are caught five sharks are killed so i think the importance as you mentioned in your presentation of knowing where your food comes from and either how it's raised how it's caught how it's grown um but you know you you can make choices to buy products that you know have a, a better um you know, there, there's there's been um, better methods of putting that food on your plate. So I know that tuna is one of them. And, um, you know, that just that number, 100 million sharks are killed a year. It's just a staggering number. And I think that the representation you used in the film, your graphics were really excellent to, to make that point visually. Yeah, and I would just add to that, Susan, that uh, the, the film... Uh, <clears throat> will be on uh, Google Play and Apple iTunes um, in November. Um, uh, sadly, there's going to be a per-click fee, so you can see it now at the uh, Princeton Environmental Film Festival. Through Sunday. Uh, through Sunday. <laughs> through Sunday for free. So tell your friends, uh, see it now uh, while you can. Yeah, I've watched it a couple of times now, So, and I think I've, I've – gotten different things out uh, out of it um, throughout. I wanted to just talk a little bit about, I thought it was really interesting how you, you um, I mean, you had a lot of ground to cover, but I, I thought it was very interesting about the, the, the shark's navigation and how far they're able to travel. And I know that uh, uh, the person in the film was talking about it and mentioning, you know, how do they do these? And it was mentioned that it could be magnetic fields, it could be ocean currents or even the stars, and if you just want to talk a little bit about that, because that's really fascinating. Yeah, um, you know, the tagging of these sharks has, has revealed a lot over the last few years, and uh, the hammerhead sharks that they tagged in the Galapagos, uh, what they found was that uh, hammerheads are like homebodies. They have a reef that they like, and then at night they go hunting. They're nocturnal animals, and uh, they would follow a radial, uh, do their hunting, go out uh, 20, 40, 50 miles, and turn around and come back along that same radial to that same reef. And so scientists really don't know why, but the feeling is that they use the Earth's magnetic field. And the, the reason is, is that the sharks are, they know their depth, so they'll start off along the surface, and then every once in a while, they'll go down to a deep depth so that they'll get their bearings. They'll have a much better signal from the magnetic field. Then they'll come back up uh, to the surface. You know, the, the sharks, and I talk about this in the book, have uh, electrical sensors, these little pits. Um, and they're capable of detecting uh, electrical signals, magnetic fields. And so they're actually well equipped with the with what they need to actually follow the magnetic fields. Of course, uh, some scientists have theorized that they're maybe looking at the stars or currents, but I think right now the number one way for, the, for them to navigate is uh, using their senses to, for magnetic fields. Great. So we have a question here from Doug B. He wrote, in a few scenes, sharks appear to have attached long trailing tags on their undersides. Some cases uh, there were feeding fish. Uh, was I imagining these? And if not, what was this? Okay, the first part of uh, your question broke up, Susan, so you'll have to repeat that again. I apologize. Yep, no problem. In a few scenes, sharks appear to have attached long trailing tags on their undersides. 
some cases there were feeding they were feeding fish was i just imagining these and if not what was this okay so i think you're, you're referring um and, and thank you for the question is the the hooks so when when people go catching sharks they think uh they've hooked the shark they really don't want it you don't want to eat them so they'll cut the line well the shark does get away but that hook is still in the shark's mouth and that fishing line can be as long as uh, uh, a few feet to 30 yards and that shark has to take that with it wherever it goes until the the hook comes out and sometimes that hook just doesn't come out so i think that's what you're uh referring to um a lot of the the sharks that are seen uh have those lines out of their mouths and and i think a message that i would have for the fishermen uh number one is you really don't need to be catching sharks for fun it's better to leave an apex predator alone uh we need them and uh if you think you're doing okay by letting them go think again because a shark will often die after being caught and released. And the reason is that they develop lactic acid in their system very quickly. Uh, the stresses uh, puts pressure on their heart. Some sharks will uh, die from that lactic acid uh, buildup within hours of being released. So again, the best thing to do is just uh, leave them alone. I'm planning on that. <laughs> so let's see what else we have here. Okay, I think uh, we've gotten to the questions that were posted. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, throw a question back to you about, uh, so, so this is a question, and I, I thought a lot about this. I thought about this the first time I saw the film, and I know we talked about it months ago, way, way back. Uh, but I thought about it again as I watched um, the film this week another time which was you there's a lot of brutality in the film and yeah. as a filmmaker you chose to to depict that brutality it's, it's graphic and i know that was probably a difficult choice for you so if you want to talk a little bit about your decision making in that regard yeah, Susan, that, that's a great question. And uh, I, you know, when I was editing the film and um, working alongside the editor, uh, that came up. Um, you know, maybe you know, maybe we, we should tone it down a little bit. And uh, as a director, I made the decision uh, to show it because I think people really need to understand what's happening to sharks. And I think when you see it graphically as difficult and 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 even for me uh because i i love sharks uh i it's it's painful to watch so i i, I appreciate uh the question the the one thing actually you know uh, we were talking uh, earlier susan is you know about uh, peter benchley when he realized he made a big mistake in writing jaws when he was scuba diving and he stumbled across a scene of dead sharks that had been finned. And um, when you fin a shark and throw it overboard, it literally suffocates to death. It is a slow, painful death. And I think that uh, sadly people need to know that and to show it. And uh, so I made the decision to leave it in there. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, you know people are going to be energized yeah. and to think about their seafood, to think about uh, getting involved, writing their legislator, doing those things to stop it. I think I think it's a necessary truth. Yeah, and we uh, we, can't, we can't yeah. just used to look away from things that because they make us squeamish or uncomfortable, um, especially if we don't want to accept those things. So we we uh, so in the few minutes before we we started this uh, session tonight. We were talking about Jaws and Peter Benchley because he, he lived in Princeton, he and his wife Wendy. And um, in the first few years of our film festival, uh, Wendy, along with their friend Stan Waterman, who's an underwater cameraman, it's extraordinary, 
they visited the film festival and they um we had one really wonderful evening talk and they um they spoke about that about how you know it was it was you know, incredibly successful for his career to publish jaws but you know he had to he realized that it um had a really detrimental effect on sharks at least the perception that that people had of sharks and he worked you know really hard after that in later years um as a uh, conservationist and, and advocate for sharks so you know it's interesting but that 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 whole tale about um you know there was that story of the great white shark that came up the um in Matawan, New Jersey, and it came up, it came out of the ocean, came up the river, and it was just, um, I guess it was around the turn of the century. It's a pretty, pretty fa famous case. There's a few books about it, but I think, I think that might have been the story that he read that kind of, that's where the idea uh, came from for, for Jaws, so. Yeah, it was a nice demons and everything you know like it's the demonization of nature rather than the respect for nature i think maybe hopefully that will change starting to change i don't know yeah i think susan it is it is starting to change i think people are beginning to get an understanding about sharks and their real nature and uh you know these myths take time to uh to change and uh but i, th I think we're i think we're getting there in this country and uh, I'm hoping my book is going to, and the film is going to help with that process. Before we close it out, uh, you told me a couple of very interesting things earlier about your next film. If you want to share a little bit about that and kind of get people excited about that. Yes. So uh, my next film is on uh, plastic in the ocean, which we're all well aware of, of the issue. Uh, what I'm doing in the plastic film is looking at what that impact uh, is on the oceans and ultimately on us. And uh, we are getting a lot of plastic into our bodies. There was one statistic, some of you may have heard this, that we have about a credit card's worth of plastic in us at any one particular time. And uh, when it comes to eating fish and oh, plastic is in the ocean, uh, they, I answer the question, are we getting that plastic in us and what does it mean? So the, I'm finishing up the film, I hope to get it out there soon. Um, and I'm gonna put that uh, film uh, or at least the, the highlights of it on my nonprofit safeguardtheseas.org. So you can follow this issue. And I think that, um, I, obviously we don't have time, but I wanna get into the point what people can do to stop plastic uh, getting into the ocean. One simple way is uh, make sure you buy all cotton clothes, synthetic fibers that go into our clothes. Uh, you wash those clothes, that releases thousands of micro particles of plastic. So uh, so this is a big issue. And uh, of course, number one right now is uh, focused on, on sharks. And so uh, if you read the book and get... Uh, fully acquainted with that, um, then the next thing to do is uh, we got to focus on getting rid of the plastic. Thank you. And just want to point out, you can purchase the book here by clicking on the green bar. You'll be buying it, buying locally from Labyrinth Books. They also have a display at the store if you want to go in person. I can also mention if you go to our landing page for Princeton Environmental Film Festival, which is PrincetonLibrary.org slash P-E-F-F. -F. Scroll down a little bit and you'll see that we have two book lists for 2020. Uh, we have uh, 10 books. With, uh, they all have environmental themes. There's 10 books for adults and Emperors of the Deep is on that list. We have a copy in the library's collection and we have uh, 10 books for youth. So check that out too because um, then you can, uh, all of those books are available at the library. I also want to point out that we have another Q&A tomorrow, which will be for um, the film Youth Unstoppable. And we will have the uh, subject of the film and the, she's also the filmmaker. So please join us for that. We're running the films through Sunday. We'd love to be in person with you as always. I know Kim's in, 
um, on this chat. She feels the same way. But we're really glad that we did it this way because we really wanted to share these films. We love the films that we picked for this year. And one way or another, we're showing them. So thank you very much, William. It's been a pleasure to have you. It's so great meeting you. Thank you for sharing your film with us. And we hope to bring you back for your next film. Okay. Thank you, Susan. It was wonderful to be part of the festival. And hope to see you next year. Thank, thank you. Very much. Have a good night. Bye. Good night.